Production and broadcast of Dayton Shaping the Next Century is made possible in part by the Pew Center for Civic Journalism and NCR. Dayton, Ohio at 200, a metropolitan area of nearly a million residents. Perhaps no other city has more reason to celebrate a bicentennial. Dayton was founded along the banks of a river as likely to drown it as enrich it. And there were few, if any, significant natural resources. But the community never lacked unnatural resources. The twin virtues of imagination and inventiveness. Early on, Dayton attracted and nurtured those with hopes, dreams, and ambitions. By the start of the 20th century, Dayton, Ohio, the place with no reason to exist, would explode with ideas and innovations that would profoundly change the world. With 200 years of history, we celebrate and honor those that molded the Dayton we know today. And we reflect on how they might help us reshape the Dayton of tomorrow. This is where Dayton was born. Today we recognize it as Greenville, Ohio, but in 1795, it was the site of a small American military fort where treaty negotiations played a key role in shaping present-day Ohio. Battles had raged throughout the 1790s between Native Americans and settlers, each of whom wished to stake a claim to Ohio. In 1791, a thousand warriors led by Little Turtle defeated American forces under the command of Governor Arthur St. Clair. Three years later, General Anthony Wayne, nicknamed Mad Anthony despite his superior military skills, defeated the Native Americans at the Battle of Fallen Timbers near present-day Maumee, Ohio, setting the stage for peace negotiations. The Treaty of Greenville, which was finally signed on August 3, 1795, established a geographic line south of which settlement could proceed unchallenged. Eight months later, a new settlement was founded along the banks of the Great Miami River. It was named after Jonathan Dayton, a New Jersey representative to the Constitutional Convention. The community grew quickly. Within three years, the surest sign of settlement arrived. Newcomb's Tavern was assessed a grand total of $29.74 in local taxes. Rivers have been the lifeblood of many cities. The Great Miami sometimes sluggish, at other times a raging torrent, would become the heart and sometimes sinister soul of Dayton. The Miami Erie Canal arrived in Dayton in 1836. With it came a boom. The population doubled within a decade. The canal connected Dayton with the world. It gave pioneering Dayton a cosmopolitan flavor, as locals could buy goods from New York City that arrived in Dayton via the local waterway. While the canal was a major north-south connection, the nation's most important east-west overland route passed just north of Dayton, the National Road. This unique intersection led at least one entrepreneur to start his own transportation business in Dayton. In 1850, Eliam Elijah Barney and his partner, the curiously named Preserved Smith, founded the Barney and Smith Car Works. They built railway cars. Before Dayton itself had a rail line, their first cars had to be delivered by the Canal and Ohio River but the business flourished. After the Civil War, 
Barney and Smith built luxurious rail cars to match the extravagant standard of rail travel during the era. The company became one of the largest rail car builders in the country. By the 1890s, Barney and Smith were sold to outside investors. By then, steel was replacing wood and rail car construction. The company resisted change, and the old rail works would eventually disappear in an auctioneer's bankruptcy sale. Yet Barney and Smith prospered during years when Dayton itself was building a reputation as a place where things were made. It was the city of a thousand chimneys, at a time when chimneys meant industrial production and not pollution. Factories hummed, and the output was prodigious and varied. Hay rakes and heating stoves, paper boxes and cigars, fertilizer and ice cream. From a place where things were made, Dayton became a place where things were invented. By 1880, the city was a national leader and issued patents. This early inventiveness did not change the world, but it did change Dayton. It built a pool of skilled and resourceful workers, and the capital to build upon the ideas of the imagination. By the start of the 20th century, the world was about to change radically, and Dayton's role in that transformation would be immense. The first major invention to leave Dayton did something Americans liked best. It counted money. John H. Patterson was a man of quirks. He took four baths a day. He wore underwear stitched from billiard table felt and he rigorously pursued health and exercise fads and expected his employees to follow. But as founder of the National Cash Register Company, Patterson was one of the nation's foremost business innovators and he made his products synonymous with Dayton worldwide. Patterson bought the rights to the cash register in 1884. He knew businesses could and would use his product his success would depend on how well he marketed the cash register. Patterson invented most of the forms of modern merchandising. He developed direct mail advertising. Then, as now, some were less than pleased. One prospect wrote, For heaven's sakes, let up! What have we done to you? Patterson created the image of the modern salesperson. They would be well-dressed. The man who is seldom turned down in an interview is the well-groomed, well-appearing salesman. His sales force would be exceedingly pleasant, answer even the most stupid question pleasantly. And above all, NCR salespeople would be persistent. Do not be sidetracked if your customer claims he already knows about cash registers. If he did, he would be using one. To boost production, Patterson created the best working conditions in turn-of-the-century America. The changes were considered revolutionary. Wages were raised, dangerous equipment shielded, a subsidized company cafeteria was opened, free medical and dental care were offered. Patterson established a company library, sponsored free concerts and lectures in the NCR auditorium, and built a company park for employees. NCR became ingrained in the fabric of Dayton life. Patterson insisted philanthropy played no role in his decisions. Rather, he claimed the benefits paid off in higher productivity and quality. The theory worked superbly. By 1907, NCR was selling 2,000 cash registers a week, and the company would grow for decades both physically and economically. To this day, for many people around the world, the name of Dayton is synonymous with the sound of a ringing bell.
while John Patterson was building a cash register empire on one end of Dayton, the elevator operator in the downtown Callahan building spent his spare time reading Shakespeare and Tennyson. That operator was Paul Lawrence Dunbar. He was the only African American in his class at Dayton Central High. He was popular, president of the Literary Society, a friend of Orville Wright. In fact, the two collaborated on a short-lived newspaper aimed at Dayton's black community. After graduation, Dunbar sought office employment, but the doors of white-collar opportunity were closed to a young black man. This pivotal circumstance would help create and define Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the poet. He was the first African-American acclaimed by both blacks and whites during an age of rising racism. Yet Dunbar claimed to write, to sing songs of God and nature, to prove to the many that the few are human. His first book of poems, Oak and Ivy, appeared in 1892. His second, Majors and Minors, earned praise from America's foremost literary critic, William Dean Howells. The accolades launched a literary tour of the United States and England. When he returned to Dayton for a reading before the Women's Literary Society, Dunbar remarked, I've taken all of them up and down in the Callahan elevator. The reading went well, but a number of women left before refreshments were served, so as not to be seen eating with a black man. Fame had done little to blur the focus of racism. At the turn of the century, Dunbar lived and worked mostly in Washington, D.C. During these years, he contracted tuberculosis, then incurable. Ailing, he returned to Dayton, where he died at the age of 34. Dayton's gift of imagination to the world of arts and letters passed away much too soon. Orville Wright was mild-mannered and impish. Once, while listening to a politician speak, he remarked, if that man is honest, he should sue his face for slander. His brother Wilbur was serious, almost humorless. He acted as head of the family when their father, a bishop of the United Brethren Church, was away on business. But working together, Orville and Wilbur tackled one of man's longest standing fascinations, flight. The secrets of the birds had eluded mankind for thousands of years. The Wright brothers, bicycle makers from Dayton, Ohio, solved the mysteries in 55 months, working part-time. They did it with imagination, inventiveness, and Midwestern common sense. The Wrights started with glider designs they tested in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, which offered wind for lift and sand for safe landings. By 1902, they were making controlled glides of 500 feet. They became the world's first pilots, the art of handling airborne craft. Back in Dayton, they set their sights on adding power to their glider. Their mechanic, Charlie Taylor, built the engine. It was extraordinarily simple. No carburetor, no fuel pump, no spark plugs. It had two speeds, one of which was off. Meanwhile, Orville and Wilbur traded opinions about propeller design. Charlie Taylor recalled, both boys had tempers. They would shout at each other, sometimes terrible. I don't think they really got mad, but they sure got awfully hot. By June of 1903, the Wright brothers reached agreement on their propellers, eight and a half feet long, three layers of laminated spruce shaped with hand tools. They returned to Kitty Hawk in the fall. The chances for flight did not seem good. Mechanical setbacks forced delays. The weather turned cold. 
From their meager base camp, they decided to make one last attempt at flying on December 17, 1903. Members of a nearby life-saving team helped slide the aircraft into position. One lifesaver was recruited to snap the shutter on the Wright's camera at the moment of flight. He did so, taking the most famous amateur photograph ever. The Wrights completed four more flights at Kitty Hawk, none of more than 1,000 feet. While North Carolina will take credit for the first flights, the Wright brothers created the first practical aircraft here at Huffman Prairie, just outside of Dayton and nearby Greene County. The Wrights made 150 flights at Huffman, working the bugs out of their flying machines. By October 1905, Wilbur had made a flight of more than 26 miles. Except for a handful of eyewitnesses, few would believe the Wright brothers had actually flown. Three times the Wright brothers tried to sell their invention to the federal government. Three times they were told that man could not fly. It wasn't until 1908 that vindication would belong to Wilbur and Orville. With cameras rolling, the brothers gave public demonstrations in Paris and just outside of Washington, D.C. Onlookers watched them soar gracefully overhead. Overwhelmed by the three-dimensional world the bicycle makers from Dayton, Ohio had created. Charles Kettering was an Ohio farm boy. He spent 10 years attending the same one-room school, got a new pair of boots each autumn, and called himself with pride a hillbilly. Kettering was an inventor. He reached Dayton in 1904 as a newly hired electrical engineer at NCR. A few years later, Kettering and an executive named Edward Deeds decided to moonlight as inventors in the barn behind Deed's home. Kettering designed an improved ignition system for autos, and Deed's sold the invention to Cadillac. It was the start of Dayton Engineering Laboratories Incorporated, which chewed down nicely to Delco. Kettering's next invention revolutionized the auto industry. Up to that time, cars were started with hand cranks. It was a difficult and sometimes dangerous task. But Kettering discovered an electric motor could start an engine. The running motor could then generate current for the spark plugs and electricity for headlights. He completed the system by adding a storage battery for future starts. With minor modifications, it's the electrical system all autos still use today. In 1919, Kettering and Deeds sold Delco to General Motors, a decision that made Dayton a GM town. Kettering became GM's research chief, commuting between his Dayton home and Detroit for 27 years. He was a man of great and varied interests and a popular public speaker. As he aged, he spoke increasingly and eloquently in favor of failure. It is not a disgrace to fail, but you must analyze each failure to find its cause. You must learn how to fail intelligently, for failing is one of the greatest arts in the world. People fail forward to success. On the evening of Monday, March 24, 1913, Bishop Milton Wright wrote in his diary, I apprehended a flood, felt the danger of it. The bishop, it seemed, had become a prophet of biblical proportions. Dayton was prone to flooding, but never had it seen a storm like the one that began Easter weekend, 1913. The morning after Bishop Wright wrote in his diary, the levees gave way along the great Miami River. One downtown hotel guest recorded, 
Before noon on Tuesday, Jefferson and Third Streets were raging, roaring torrents of a depth of 12 to 14 feet. Down both streets poured a mass of drift, and every few minutes, some struggling, drowning horse. It was a bad week for horses. More than 1,400 perished. In the flood's aftermath, the city was littered with their carcasses. People saved themselves however they could. One resident chopped his way onto his roof when his attic began to fill with water. By Tuesday afternoon, exploding gas lines caused fires to break out. One eight-year-old resident said, my Sunday school teacher always talked about the way the world would end with fire and water, and I thought that was happening. Dayton's flood was front page news across the country. A lack of reliable information prompted fearful exaggeration. The facts were bad enough. Fifteen square miles of the city were submerged under six to eighteen feet of water. Fourteen thousand buildings were destroyed or damaged. Fifty thousand were homeless. National Cash Register's headquarters, just south of downtown, sat on high ground above the flood. John Patterson immediately spearheaded relief efforts, hastily built boats, rescued many from rooftops and second-story windows. An emergency hospital was set up at NCR. Refugees lined up for dry clothes, hot meals, and warm beds. And those who lost homes found refuge in a tent city. When the losses were totaled, the flood caused more than a billion dollars in damage by today's standards, and 97 people drowned or died from exposure. As the flood waters receded, a thick layer of mud blanketed the city, and the cleanup started immediately. And the people of Dayton resolved to never let another flood destroy the city. In 14 days, Two million dollars was raised for planning a comprehensive flood control system. The results of that fundraising effort still stand today. This is Huffman Dam. It sits not far from where the Wright brothers perfected flight. It was designed by Arthur Morgan, a young engineer who came to Dayton in 1913 to direct flood control. Morgan's solution is almost absurdly simple. Dams with holes in them were constructed, which keeps the flow of water into the Great Miami steady and well below flood stage. It's an automatic system with no moving parts and requires no human action. Since the flood control system was completed, the waters of the Great Miami have never threatened the city or its people, as they did on those spring days more than 80 years ago. The innovations of Patterson, Kettering, the Wrights, and others changed the world and would define Dayton through much of the 20th century. Their awesome contributions created a Dayton that was a good place to be. Innovation created a prosperous and robust community. But the only constant in the world is change. All of those honored here were acutely aware of this fact, and so we, must ask ourselves, what would Dunbar, who so eloquently wrote of one race, the human race, make of today's race relations? Perhaps we need to look again at the message of peace and harmony in his century-old words. How would John Patterson react to the rapid transformations in today's business world? Maybe by looking for opportunities where none seem to exist. And how would the Wright brothers respond to the challenges of technological revolution? One might think they would still labor to make the impossible possible. As we celebrate 200 years of Dayton, let's not forget the accomplishments and achievements of those that have come and gone. Imagination and inventiveness 
have been kind to this community, imagination and inventiveness are still powerful allies as we reshape the next century. have a choice when watching television. When you want to escape from the violence and sex you find on other channels, you can turn to Channel 16, that's all. Production and broadcast of Dayton Shaping the Next Century is made possible in part by the Pew Center for Civic Journalism. And... NCR.